Information. Ah, okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brandy Williams, and welcome to the Inner City Pollinator Oasis, uh, presented by Brandy Williams of Garden Butterfly. So, first of all, I'd like to um, say thank you for inviting me to speak with you today and joining your uh, meeting. Uh, this first slide, I will say, uh, in my opinion, is one of the most important uh, slides within the slide deck because it deals with purpose. So for me, it was, you know, me having a vision. I was able to just see what I wanted to do when I first started out. Uh, well, I'm a licensed landscape contractor. When I first started out, you know, my ideas, you know, we purchased our home, I saw the lawn, I immediately knew that I wanted to, you know, rip out the lawn, but not necessarily sure what I wanted uh, to do with it, knowing, you know, I wanted to, you know, participate in environmental stewardship and all of that. But I just had a vision. I wanted beautiful plants. Um, I did want succulents because I knew that we have to conserve water. But the way in doing that, I wasn't quite sure yet. Um, so, you know, I just started showing up at different events. Um, I became active within the industry because I had that vision. Uh, but once becoming active within the industry, you know, I had the, the vision, you know, my blinders were on, but then uh, there was that self-doubt that would come up. And then I had imposter syndrome that came up, you know, even though I was, you know, active and, you, you know, working. And then there wasn't, there was a situation where I was uh, questioned and literally laughed at. <laughs> in my face because what I was doing, the confidence I had at just moving about, that kind of took me back and it slowed me down a bit. But then I said, you know what, sometimes, you know, you that push comes along and that was that push. It, you know, said I was going to let that, you know, I was going to fall or I was going to stand up. So after a little crying, you know, it's been tough. You know, I cried a little during that time because I wasn't sure what I was doing, but I still had that vision. Out of that, I got out of it. And then I just blossomed and I just came out of whatever it was that I was in, that self-doubt and uh, that imposter syndrome. And I said, you know what? No, nope. Brandy, there's one life to live. You're creative just do it, you know, and that's where I am right now. So I had uh, the vision, but it took a while for me to really understand what my purpose is and what my purpose was. So I am walking in my purpose. You know, I'm not done. There's still a lot to do, but I'm walking in that, uh, in my purpose. And because of that, I'm here talking to you today or talking with you uh, today. So any questions you have, you can put them in the chat. Um, yeah, so we'll get through this. Now, all the slides within the deck are from our garden, our South Central Los Angeles garden. It is about, it's less than a uh, thousand square feet. So. Any of the uh, images you see, you'll see insects, you'll see the butterflies and moths and um, California native plants and succulents, all from our garden. So as I communicated, there was this vision. And then once I identified what my purpose was, you know, I really started to, I went from, I'll say, creation to education, I'll say, because I said, you know what, Brandy, you've created this space. Let's bring people into this space and help to encourage others, your neighbors, your community members, and just people whom you meet who want to come and visit. So that's what I've done. So I've had um, college students here, just my community here. I've had events here just to talk about plants and pollinators and what you can do in your garden. As you see here, here's an example. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. 
So uh, community service, promoting environmental stewardship and connecting with people. When I am out in the garden, because I am just so happy, I don't, I, I guess I'll say proud or more energized about what I've done. And when people walk by, when people walk their dogs and then they ask questions about what's going on in our garden, it really makes me happy. And I understand that I am fulfilling my purpose. So promoting that environmental stewardship, when people want to ask questions, I will invite them in. As I communicated, you know, I've had events here. Uh, children have come to the garden. Uh, they see how uh, we are growing our herbs and vegetables, as you can see here. So it's just about connecting with people and knowing what just a small inner city garden can do. Vision, as I said, those plants. Well, why, Brandy, do you want to plant these plants? It was all about the pollinators. Butterflies are always beautiful to me, you know, working in the garden with my grandmother in Compton, we'd see these butterflies and I was always attracted to them and they would make me happy. Of course, hummingbirds, uh, beetles, moths, flies, wasps, just really understanding the importance of pollinators and even my grandmother communicating to me about how they um, just witness pollinators in the garden. She wouldn't say pollinators, but she would just communicate the bees, the butterflies, and uh, the beetles. So learning about pollinators and why I wanted to uh, plant for them, because without pollinators, we won't have those apples, apricots, bananas, and coffee, chocolate, a uh, grapefruit, kiwi, mango, all the beautiful jazz uh, with the uh, fruits and vegetables. So even learning about that, once I started to study about plants and study about um, the pollinators and the fruits and vegetables and how you can create a food forest at your home, inside uh, your garden, in your landscape, it was just exciting and just me really understanding that I I have something here and I have a job to do. And the job that I have to do is one that is both uh, creative and meaningful. So at Garden Butterfly Los, South Central Los Angeles, we are planting for the moths and butterflies, understanding that the caterpillars are whole specific and they're only feeding on a foliage of particular plant species, well, many caterpillars. Uh, the shrubs provide shelter for adult butterflies and moths and the natural garden debris, the leaf litter provides an ideal environment for overwintering, overwintering pollinators. So instead of just, let's see, adding mulch, adding gravel mulch, we had to add the organic mulch. And I'll be honest with you, when we first started our garden, we actually planted quite a bit of succulents. And with succulents, we incorporated the gravel mulch. But when I really started to understand what pollinators needed and how, um, much, how much organic mulch is important for wildlife and the overwintering pollinators, we had to get rid of a lot of that uh, gravel and bring in the organic mulch. Now, my company is, uh, the name of my company is Garden Butterfly. But if you visit Garden Butterfly South Central Los Angeles, you will see more hummingbirds than the butterflies. We do see moths, quite a few moths, but it's really the, honey, the hummingbirds. Uh, most of the hummingbirds uh, feed on the small insects and floral nectar. Uh, the hummingbirds are attracted to those long tubular flowers and can feed while hovering. So when I learned about how uh, hummingbirds uh, feed on the flowers and I really wanted to see the hummingbirds hover, I said, you know what? 
Well, let's bring in those epilobium plants, those California native plants that have that tubular uh, trumpet shape. And also the salvia, the caliandra, californica, you will see uh, that uh, growing in a, a container plant in our garden. I have an image of that. And that's a very important plant because it blooms year round. The Dudleya provide nectar in spring and early summer. And also the aloe plants that we have here bloom usually uh, from early spring to summer. So I mentioned the epilobium, the salvia, caliandra, californica, the Dudleya, and the aloe plants because it is a mixture of plants that uh, provide nectar throughout the year for those hummingbirds that uh, aren't migrating. So for the hummingbirds, you know, that stay in our area. And also, I just wanted to uh, point out that we do leave some spider silk in the landscape. And that is why I believe we have so many hummingbirds because they use that spider silk to uh, build their nests. In identifying the different plants uh, that um, I wanted to grow in the landscape for pollinators, I did have to be mindful of the beneficial insects and how beneficial insects manage pests effectively. So, of course, we have the bees, the hoverflies, beetles, praying mantis, green lace wigs, green lace wings, uh, dragonflies, and parasitic moths. You see those. Uh, when they are active throughout the year. And if you see in the image here, you see a ladybug going after those aphids on a tomato plant in our garden. So here we are. When we first purchased our beautiful home, you see the lawn. I saw vision. So we went from lawn to a regenerative landscape, a sustainable landscape and a pollinator habitat. So you see the before and after picture. And then you see a close up of not only is it a pollinator habitat, it is a dry garden redefined. I call it a dry garden redefined because as you know, many people always say, oh, California native plants, they're dull, they're dry, even the adjective, they're crispy. <laughs> but California native plants are beautiful throughout the year. And what I wanted to do was incorporate California native plants and succulents and some non-native plants that I adore. Uh, for example, the lavender plant, incorporate those into a small space, which is less than uh, 1000 square feet. And I've successfully done that. Not only is this a, a dry, the gar the dry garden redefined, but it is also a sensory garden. When you walk throughout the garden, you're hearing the hummingbirds, the bees, you're, you're uh, smelling uh, the sage, the aroma of the sage and the California native plants. And it's beautiful, the beauty of the color and how the plants are placed, the, the uh, placement of the plants. So how everything has just come together to give you just some real cool texture and form throughout this really small space. And I also call this a scrapbook garden. So within the a pollinator-friendly South Central Los Angeles garden. There are seven elements of a pollinator garden, which are the nectar plants. You need those nectar plants for energy and uh, to attract the pollinators. Uh, the larval host plants, which are food for the caterpillars. We have several uh, water source uh, components within the garden. We have a bird bath um, and a recirculating fountain. Uh, we provide cover and shelter from the weather and uh, predators with the shrubs, fallen logs, and hollow pithy branches. So when I, for example, when I prune the uh, white sage, I leave about six inches to give an opportunity for uh, uh, nesting bees. And also this is a place 
where this is where a young oh my goodness this is a place where pollinators can raise their young and of course we we aren't using any uh, pesticides so here at south central los angeles at garden butterfly we conserve water with a rainwater harvesting system. Our system is the uh, rain garden. We also have a swell, as you see uh, in the image, the bottom right. And we connect the, uh, let's see, we connect our rain garden is connected uh, from the a downspout to the rain barrel. Uh, we have a smart irrigation system. Now I hand water our plants in the landscape but our raised garden beds with our fruits and vegetables, we do have a solar powered uh, low volume irrigation system and um, micro sprinklers. And as I mentioned, we hand water. Everything in our garden is hand water. The sustainable lawn removal methods, what we did was we used the physical uh, method. We actually got out with the shovel and removed that lawn from the parkway and also in our landscape. We did use sheet mulching for a small area in the landscape. Um, there, as far as the weed removal, the least toxic herbicides, if absolutely possible, but we do the physical and mechanical methods. Of uh, the mulch, we use approximately two to four inches for weed suppression and for moisture retention. And also our ground cover plants to crowd out the weeds. And we choose plants based on plant community. So we're in the coastal sage scrub community. So we have those buckwheat plants and the uh, California fuchsia plants. And our leaf litter provides an environment for, for ground dwelling wildlife. And we use the chop and drop method. So as far as the wildlife that we see here, of course, the ladybugs, the damselflies, uh, sweat bees, carpenter bees, leaf, color, leaf cutter bees, bumblebees, and of course, the honeybee, the honeybees, swallowtail, west coast lady, the gray hair streak butterfly, and the white line sphinx moth. We have the house finch, black Phoebe birds. And as I communicated, more than anything, we see hummingbirds throughout our garden, throughout the year, actually. This slide shows all the wildlife uh, at Garden Butterfly South. Uh, Central Los Angeles. If you notice at the bottom left, you see a fallen log where, of course, those are cavity nesting bees, uh, which have made a nest in cut logs here in our landscape. Uh, the monarch chrysalis you see that is formed on the, um, the uh, 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 rain barrel, and also you see how the monarch butterfly emerges, the Gulf fritillary, uh, which you see at the top right, and you see the cobwebs that I mentioned, how we have so many hummingbirds because of the spiders, the uh, silk that they leave, and we just leave them for the hummingbirds. So here's an area within our garden our garden is fit for our Mediterranean climate. Now we have a Petalanthus bracteatus, although it is not a California native plant, it is a beautiful tall succulent that grows well within our landscape and hummingbirds visit this plant and they also uh, perch on the tips of each of the, uh, the leaves. And also we have uh, the Mexican sage. Now this plant here is no longer uh, growing in our landscape, um, but we do have many of the other plants. We have uh, another sage here and uh, the, um, gosh, this is the salvia bees bliss. So plants that are, that are dense, 
require low water and uh, diversity in height, form, and in texture. And if you notice, the mulch that we're using is the organic mulch. And down right at the base of the screen, you'll see Daimondia. Now, although that is a non-native uh, plant, it does grow well in our area. And I find, well, it's one of my favorite plants because it is a really dense ground cover. So this is an image um, in our garden. Uh, you see the sweet lavender, non-native, and also the aeonium, but of course you see the California poppy, and you also see a uh, Santa Barbara daisy. It's not a California native, but next to that, you do see a California native, which is the Artemisia David's choice. So if you see how uh, we were able to blend many of the California native and non-native plants, and we also have the California fuchsia, which is at the top right here. And then this is a, a sage plant, but I'll wait to show you which plant that is. And you can also see the hummingbird sage right here. Okay. So yeah, you know, people will always say, no, you have to plant with natives. And at first I said, yeah, I got to just rip out my succulents. And I said, you know what? I just have to meet myself halfway. And this is how, you know, I decided to do this with the California natives, succulents, and then some non-native plants. But this is an up close a shot of what I would describe uh, as a scrapbook design style. I say scrapbook design because I'm a scrapbook artist and I like to plant, uh, not plant, but actually um, design my scrapbooks. You know, you just add things on top and layer your designs on top of each other. And so that's what I've done in this landscape. So here you have the boulders and then I just tucked, um, here you have actually a California native. This is a buckwheat and then you have some succulents. Now, of course you'll say Brandy, well, these California natives and they are going to get big. Yes, a few of them will. But in the meantime, until in between time, I just let them grow. I identify my garden as my lab. So people come and I want them to see the diversity of California native plants and, Cal and non-native plants and how they can grow together. And for me, if they can identify just a few plants that uh, will work just by seeing how I've just added all of these plants, I've done my job. <laughs> so. Here you see a yarrow, and of course, you're not just going to plant a yarrow and a California native buckwheat that close together because it will overcrowd. But in this case, because this is my lab and this is a scrapbook garden, I just want people to see the beauty and to uh, encourage them to be creative. You do want to plant, you know, right plant, right place, you know, um, as far as spacing as well, because plants won't grow well together, they won't survive. But because again, this is my garden and then this is my lab when I'm pruning. And sometimes I'll take a few plants out in an area such as this. So there are areas in my garden where, you know, one year you'll come back and you may not see that plant there. So, yeah. So this is the uh, staircase that you uh, just, well, not staircase, but the two steps that you uh, just saw. And this is another um, angle where you see a yarrow and then you see a succulent here. But again, this is just to show you just some creativity of what you can do. Maybe someone wants to just plant yarrow and then have this whole entire area here just filled with yarrow. Now this is the Daimondia. It's perfect for this space because we do have quite a bit of traffic coming, you know, onto the landscape. 
And I wanted to grow something in this area. So I just said, I'll just plant Daimondia ground cover. And it's so beautiful. It's lovely because what it's doing is it's growing over the stepping stones. It's so beautiful. But so, yeah, you have and you have the freedom to do what you want to do when you know when you're familiar with the plants. So this is just some creativity for people. So it's not only about uh, planting the California native plants and the succulents, but it's also about growing your own food. So in this small space, we have uh, two, let's see, one, two, uh, yeah, two raised garden beds out front. And uh, one, we have our collard greens growing and then just seasonal plants. And for me, it's whatever is growing at the time that I visit a nursery when it's, you know, time for re me to replenish our garden bed. And it's our kitchen garden. We make smoothies. So everything growing in our raised beds, we eat. And so I encourage people uh, to do that. Grow what you know that you and your family are, you know, going to consume. So as you see here, that is my hand, uh, yeah, harvesting food from our garden. Now, this is a small a garden, which is located on the side of our home. And we have the culinary sage, oregano, rosemary, chamomile, and the salvia, the white sage. And it's beautiful. It, it kind of, it's <laughs> take, it, it has taken uh, over our little walkway, but I enjoy that. And, you know, I just prune it just enough. Uh, so when you walk by, you can smell the aroma of the sage as it brushes up against our clothing. You know, I just enjoy that. The garden should be an experience. So you know your garden, you know your space, you know what can grow in that walkway. walkway. I do bend the rules in my space. So of course, if you're a designer, it's not about bending the rules everywhere because you're not there maintaining that space. But if you have a, a, a an area where you can bend the rules, see if that will work for you because you'll come out with something beautiful such as this. Who would say you can grow a white sage with five or six different um, herbs in a garden bed. Well, if you, in the books, it doesn't say it works, but it works for Brandy. It works for me. <laughs> and I've just taken the time to see what works. And as you can see, it it's perfect. It looks great. And the plants are healthy and they're growing well. But again, you know, this is my garden. I'm taking the time. I'm out there. You know, I'm manicuring. I'm pruning. And intentionally, you know, this is, um, I've done this design because I needed an opportunity to be outside in the garden. So if I know that I'm growing, you know, five or six different, uh, uh, oh, goodness, Oh, goodness. Uh, plants in a small garden bed with a large California native plant. I know I have to be mindful of that and prune that area. And so I do that. So because we have a high pitched roof right in the front of our garden, it's a shade garden. So I had to determine which plants would grow well in that space. So of course, we're gonna go with the California hookera. And we have the Santa, An the Santa Ana Cardinal alum root plant growing in that space. Of course, a low to moderate water. We all know that the hookeras uh, require a little more water than our sage plants or our uh, epilobium plants, I'd say. And this is an image, an aerial image of the hookera planted right next to the California maiden hair fern 
And right above at the top, we do have a recirculating fountain. So as the water splashes out of the fountain, it helps to irrigate these plants. So it works. It's just a, de a design feature. This is a, a one area of the garden that gets shade during the winter and the fall, it gets more shade um, than the summer. And you see how the plants are growing here. Even though we only have one California native growing in this garden bed, which is the snapdragon, but let's see, hold on. We also have Yerba, um, we have Yerba Mansa growing in a pot too. And the Hookera, and we have the Aeonium growing, the Daimondia. So you see that uh, we have the asparagus fern. And where's another plant I wanted to point out? The Daimondia and the yellow bush daisy. So this was one of the first plants that we planted in our garden. And if I could do it all over again, I would plant a California native plant because right out of our picture window, I would like to see uh, um, more wildlife coming to this bush. But since it's thriving, I'll just let uh, leave it be. But whenever you have a big picture window for design purposes, I would always you know, encourage someone to uh, grow a California native shrub or tree if the space allows. So if I can switch out, if I can do this all over again, I would do that. But right now it works, it's pretty. <laughs> and, you know, I just let it be. <laughs> and so these plants are growing right at the top of the rain garden or the swell. And in this area of the garden, many of the plants, they're flourishing, I would say better than on the west side, uh, no, the east side of the garden because they're benefiting from the groundwater, from the swell and from the rain garden. So when thinking about which plants to plant in our landscape, I did consider succession planting for pollinators, uh, providing a continuous sequence of nectar and pollen resources from spring to fall. So we have the Yankee Point, the California lilac, which is growing in our parkway. Uh, we have the California poppy growing throughout the garden, the Salvia clevelandii. We also have a narrow leaf milkweed, and of course the California buckwheat. And for late bloom uh, periods, we have the California fuchsia and also goldenrod. Boom. So here's an example of the Sallandii growing and it is growing on the east uh, corner of our landscape. Blooms summer, spring through summer. It attracts hummingbirds, bees and butterflies. Oh, I want to point out if you see the understory plant, that is the, a, a manzanita but I'll show you on the next slide. So this is an image of a carpenter bee visiting the Salvia clevelandii. And also, I believe this is a California native bee. I'm not sure uh, which bee it is, but I just was able to get a really cool shot from my camera phone. And uh, yeah, so it's visiting the uh, Salvia clevelandii. Also, we have the California poppy and the uh, jelly bean uh, lemon, the monkey flower uh, growing. And right in the background, we have lavender. Just wanted to show you the color. Here's another picture of the monkey flower and we have growing yarrow, common yarrow and globe gilia, which of course is the California native. 
annual wildflower grown from seed. So if you see how beautiful the colors are, all in a small space. So we have Achelia millifolium, the common yarrow, which spreads by self-seeding and uh, rhizomes. Now this plant is growing um, in our parkway and is also growing throughout the landscape. Now, I just was surprised how prolific this plant grows, but because this is my lab, it's okay. But I let anyone know it's beautiful. But if you don't mind this plant taking over, so be it. If you are concerned about that, you may want to reconsider uh, planting this plant in your garden. But it's a, a great ground cover. Speaking about a ground cover plant, this is the Yankee Point growing in our parkway flowering winter through early spring. And this is another picture of the same plant growing in our parkway, just how beautiful. Now this one serves as an understory plant uh, to the uh, strawberry arbutus tree that we have growing. Now the salvia bees bliss, this is the showstopper at Garden Butterfly South Central uh, Los Angeles. And I was surprised when I first started growing this plant, maybe about year three, I thought it wasn't doing well and I was devastated. <laughs> I was devastated, but you know, you have to learn your plants and learn California native plants and how they're growing in the landscape. But, you know, I soon learned, no, it's happy. This plant should be growing, what, up to eight feet wide. It's growing beyond 10 feet. It extends beyond 10 feet in our landscape. So if a California native plant is happy, if it's happy with you, it will just show out. And this plant has done that. This is one of my favorite plants growing in our landscape. So uh, let's see, you have the California poppy and other non-native plants that are friendly and adapted to our region that are growing beautifully with the salvia bees bliss. Oh my gosh, I just, I just love this picture. Oh my gosh, it's just beautiful. Okay. The caramel sir, the caramel sir manzanita which is an understory plant, ground cover in our coastal sage scrub. So it's growing with the Petalanthus bracteatus, this succulent plant here. And I had the nerve, the nerve to plant a succulent, um, uh, gosh, Echeveria. And what I do is I just, when the uh, manzanita starts to creep over the edge of area, I just go in and say, excuse me, fella. And I just kind of cut around it a little because I want to see, I want to see that it's just different and it's just beautiful. And so I just want to see uh, how it is growing and it's been doing fine. And it's an understory plant um, to the salvia pozo blue. And here's a close-up of that Echeferia that I just had the nerve to plant uh, next to the manzanita. And then I'm just training it. So it'll just give it that look. So of course we had to plant the Areogonum fasciculatum plant. I believe I'm pronouncing that right, uh, correctly, if not, it's the California uh, buckwheat we all know of and love. And it's growing in our parkway. We actually, I planted three in our parkway and it has just taken over and it's done what 
I thought it was or what I planned for it to do. And it's growing well with yarrow. And I pruned this plant of uh, fall or in winter. And the California buckwheat is a companion plant. Include the sage, manzanita, cyanothus, and yarrow. When folks say, oh no, California native plants, they don't look good. They are crispy. They're, they look dry. Yes, that is the natural, uh, that is how plants grow. <laughs> they have a dormancy period and then they're alive. So the seasonal changes of this California native plant, it's beautiful. So this is an image or images of the California native plant that you saw in this slide. This is the same plant in October, but it's absolutely gorgeous. Garden Butterfly, South Central Los Angeles. It is a scrapbook garden. It is a wildlife habitat. It is a pollinator oasis. As you can see, you're walking your dog on both sides of the aisle. <laughs> Look at all of that buckwheat. So you see buckwheat, you see the uh, California fuchsia. Um, there are, let's see, the California poppy. And you also see just wildlife, uh, wildlife, wildflowers. So if you're looking at the screen to the right is the parkway. See how full that parkway is. To the left of your screen is our landscape. This picture, I had the pleasure of snapping this photo yesterday because I wanted you to see what was going on today. <laughs> and here it is. It is just absolutely beautiful. Oh, my goodness. And when I'm saying it's beautiful, oh my goodness, of course, because this is our garden, but this is how gardens look. So I'm just praising our garden, but I'm praising all California native gardens and all gardens that are just full of plants that uh, provide habitat and food for pollinators. And not only are, when you're planting and designing these gardens for pollinators, you're planning for yourself because you have an opportunity to, opportunity to sit in these gardens and to unwind and just decompress. It's a stress reliever. And if you are a designer, this gives you an opportunity to be free and to create, again, you don't want to just do <laughs> anything in anyone else's garden, in your client's garden. But if you have your own garden, this is an opportunity for you to see what works. And um, yeah, so this is what I've done. And I just wanted you to see this. And I'm just so happy and proud of what I've done here in our community. So the Epilobium, Calistoga, uh, we... Actually, this plant, I'll be honest with you, it's I, I can't find it anymore in our garden because the hummingbird sage has taken over, but it's OK. <laughs> but uh, it was beautiful and I'm fine with that. But uh, when it was growing, uh, it, you know, it died back and it went dormant in winter. Uh, and it's a host plant and it's great for hummingbirds. So even though the Calistoga, I'm, I can't I find that plant anymore in my garden, but we uh, do have the Epilobium Catalina growing. And that was the uh, Epilobium that you saw on the parkway. And of course we know how the California fuchsia, how it spreads by rhizomes and it readily self-seeds. So if you don't mind that, of course, just plant the California fuchsia. But if you're concerned about a plant that is going to self-seed, you want to reconsider this plant. But it's beautiful. And it's the perfect plant for hummingbirds. So here's a Calistoga, California fuchsia in our landscape. Um, maybe this was about the second year when I uh, planted uh, this plant and the white line sphinx moth 
were all over it, as you see. And we have the red buckwheat, which is another showstopper, and it's starting to bloom now in our garden. And here's another image of the red buckwheat and the globe gilia and the uh, sun cups growing and the yarrow growing. And all this is right at the edge of our landscape, of our garden. So when people walk by, this is what they see. Here's another image of the buckwheat and the globe gilia going to seed. And in the far, the background, you see the sage, uh, the salvia clevelandii, and you do see some epilobium right here at the bottom right. I'll go back. And of course, the non-native plant, the Achillea moonshine yarrow. I absolutely love this plant. I use it for a dried flower arrangements. I make um, flower crowns uh, with it. And it's just a beautiful plant. And it, it, yeah, it's just perfect for dried flower arrangements. So although it is a non-native plant, it grows well in the coastal sage scrub community. And it just is just a beautiful uh, plant in our area. And the butterflies love it. And of course, we have the native milkweed. This was a gift from a client, one of my clients. So, yeah. So why succulents? They're extreme survivors. They produce nectar, even though the nectar, I would not compare the succulent nectar to California native nectar but they do produce uh, nectar and also a uh, texture in the garden. So the plants that I commonly use in potted arrangements are the aloe, cacti, echeveria, aeonium, sedum, and the California native Dudleya. When designing with uh, succulents or even California native plants, uh, the porosity of clay allows moisture to penetrate and the drainage holes, which are absolutely necessary. And California native plants for, hold on. Okay, yeah, so the California native plants that I grow in pots are the Eriogonum coast sunflower and seaside daisy and also Dudleya. So here's an image of succulents growing in uh, pots in our landscape. And we also have a, a potted strawberry tree or Arbutus marina. And you see the little <laughs> mockingbird visiting one of our uh, bird baths. And if you look at the bottom right, you'll see the California native Dudleya growing in a container. Here we have potted plants, California native uh, buckwheat, and also the seaside daisy. You have aeonium, we have aeonium. And also right here, we have a potted ceanothus plant. And let's see, okay. So the pink ice plant is growing here non-native, these are all non-native uh, succulents, but I just wanted you to see the color and just how you can uh, grow succulents in your garden, even though let's say you want a, the majority California native plants, just add those uh, potted plants with succulents. Here's another an uh, image of succulents growing in a pot and also succulents growing in ground. Here's another image. 
And this cute hummingbird perched atop the Petalanthus bracteatus, which is a succulent non-native, but this is growing uh, in our garden. Now the Dudleya, uh, which is summer dormant, Dudleya is like to be planted in a crevice on slopes and between rocks. And they are great container plants. So we have quite a few of them growing in our garden and they bloom uh, uh, once a year and they're just a beautiful plant. So here's an image of a, a, a palette garden just filled to the brim uh, with succulents. Here's another image of succulents. So just to show you, you know, what you can do with your California native plots and uh, your California native plants, either growing with uh, succulents. And here's an image of a potted plant and arrangement uh, with a California, um, the buckwheat, also we have aeonium and aloe growing all in the same pot. <laughs> so I'm growing seaside daisy, a uh, bush snapdragon and juncus in pots. These are perfect for containers. And we're just about done here. But here's another California native. This is the uh, Caliandra. Oops. Okay. And here you have succulents growing next to the uh, red buckwheat plant. And right at the base of the bird bath. I think it's a great idea to plant uh, succulents or a uh, Dutleya, as you see here, right at the base of this bird bath, because you know once the birds visit that excess water, it helps to irrigate the plants down below. Now we have mangave growing. Now this is fairly new. When I say fairly new, I'll say maybe about 18, about four years. I don't work with this plant uh, often, but it is a, a, a great succulent, of course, non-native, but it does grow well with California native plants. We have the hummingbird sage and also California fuchsia growing next to the mangave in our garden. And finally, this is just an image of the Kalinkoe paddle plant growing with the salvia bees bliss. And that concludes the slideshow of Garden Butterfly South Central Los Angeles. Well, thank you so much, Brandy. There was a couple um, comments and questions in the chat that I'll uh, I'll look for. And maybe while I'm kind of looking for those, people can come up with their own and you can put them in chat. I'll be happy to read them or you could just, uh, just speak up and, and interrupt. Let's sure. see. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, Cindy might be a native and the yeah. fourth bigger bee. Thank you. Let me write that. That's right. Yeah. So for those that aren't that aren't reading the chat, Cindy uh, piped up with a guess on the um, on the bee that was a, this very distinctive and beautiful bee on the salvia. She said a native. Anthophora digger bee. And she says, the male Anthophora like to stare at you with their big green eyes. 
when you walk up to them in the garden, but then they go back to their business, which is looking for female digger bees. Bee. And yeah. Betsy said that's a beautiful picture, and Kathy Chambers chimed in as well, agreeing that it was beautiful. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, guys. And then I thought those potted plant pictures were really spectacular in terms of the composition of the plants in there and the colors you had going. Yeah, you know, it just, like I said, I, once I just let go, I just said, you know, I'm just going to let my creativity have at it. And I've done that. But that is just how I design um, potted plants anyway, <laughs> just with color and just knowing which plants grow well together. And of course, knowing the uh, water requirements of the plants too. Yeah, and then Cindy from the the uh, insect identification also chimed in. She said, beautiful sense of color and texture. Where do you recommend people find uh, native plants for Southern California gardens? So I, where, oh. I, I'm wondering where you shop too. Of course, Theodore Payne Foundation. Okay. <laughs> of course, Theodore Payne yeah. Foundation. Uh, where, oh, how, uh, Betty is asking how often you water and slash fertilize. So I don't fertilize any of the California native plants in the garden. I water when I believe the plants need to be watered. So um, all of the plants are well established. And when I say I water when I feel like it, I literally water when I feel like it because I've learned the landscape. So that just goes to uh, just to say, whenever you are uh, designing, like, you know, taking your time and really learning your landscape, how the plants grow, it took about four years for me to really understand what was going on. And maybe about, the, okay, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 22, maybe about the fifth year, I was really confident in knowing. So, I just water when I feel like it. The last time I watered was for the garden tour. And, you know, I had to water it to, you know, get it pretty for the garden tour. <laughs> and that was what in April, was the garden tour in April, May, June? Yeah. So the yeah. garden tour was in April. April. So, yeah, I believe that was the last time I watered. Okay. Um, so I would just say maybe once, every two months or so, I'll water. Now the succulents, I do use the uh, the rain barrel. I, you know, use the, take advantage of the a rain barrel. I use that, the water from there and yeah. All right. Um, so Cindy asks if you see your neighbors getting interested in changing their landscape. Maybe there's been a neighborhood plant exchange? Yeah, so a few of our neighbors have uh, changed from a lawn to drop tolerant. And, you know, they'll just come and just ask questions. Uh, many have started with the uh, raised garden beds. So, yeah. Okay, that's encouraging. And BCB says, thank you in all caps. And uh, Tony says, inspirational, amazing what you have done with your relatively small garden. Yeah, thank you uh, so much. You know, it's uh, we, there, I'll, I'll share this story. There's a neighbor of ours, uh, she walks by and she looks forward to the recirculating fountain. And whenever it isn't on, she'll comment about, oh, the fountain wasn't on, <laughs> wasn't on today. And sometimes I'll just leave the fountain on um, just so my neighbors can enjoy it. You know, so. that's that's very sweet. Yeah. Um, Rosalie is asking um, if you redo your pots of succulents every year or how often to keep them looking so good. I love that question, Rosalie. You know, I don't redo them every year. I don't redo them. I spruce them up. Um, yeah. So, no, I don't redo them every year. But they, they look good. Oh, you know what? Who asked me about fertilizing? Yeah, I think Betty asked that question. Betty, you know, I don't fertilize California natives. I did say that, but I do fertilize my succulents, my potted succulent plants. I do. 
So it's the fertilizer that, you know, it's keeping them so beautiful. And I do prune, you know, I'm very uh, consistent with that because I do want my succulents looking good because it's the art of the garden. Yeah, I had a question about that. I noticed your yarrow was looking, you know, delicate and, um, and, you know, compact. I have yarrow in my yard, but it's kind of big and thuggish. I don't prune mine, uh, except for maybe at the end of the season. Do you prune yours on a very consistent basis? You know what? I will prune my yarrow maybe once a year. Mm -hmm. I do prune my yarrow. And I prune it when I feel like it needs it. So I won't let it just go and uh, take over. When I see that it's getting out of hand or isn't looking as I'd like for it to look, then I'll go ahead and prune it. All right. So it sounds like I should feel like I can take mine on if I think it's just getting a little out of hand. And I think you should. Fine. Yes. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, D said she loved these photos and the well thought out design of the slides uh, and inviting aesthetic is what she said. Thank and you so much. Betty was very impressed with how healthy and well kept all the plants look. So I guess now we know the sort the the secret is the ones in pots get fertilizer, but just the succulents. Just the succulents, yeah. All right, she says you've got a green thumb for sure. Thank you. And I'm wondering what. Do you have a particular brand of fertilizer you recommend? Do you go with like the old school with fish emulsion? You know, I don't use fish emulsion. And I will say this, I don't like to promote a brand <laughs> because I don't really like to promote a brand. Um, but I do, um, oh, what, how can I say this? Uh, is, it, without... is it a liquid fertilizer or is it a like solid? It's granule. Of... Very but uh, I'll say natural. I don't know if you can say natural fertilizer, but it is a uh, granules. I'll say that. Okay. Um, I I use compost too, so I do have a compost uh, bin, and we you know take advantage of that uh, practice. So I I do compost. I use compost as well. And do you do you add that as a top mulch, or do you dig it into the soil when you're potting them? I dig it into the soil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then, um, oh, Cindy's responding to Al Sattler, and um, she says most native bees, 70% are soil nesters, so a good chance it's them, maybe referring to the ones she identified before. Uh, and then she refers to this Common Bees in California Gardens booklet from the University of California. Mm -hmm. uh, agriculture natural resources with new updated nice photos and background info so looks like that's a good place to go if you want so and and I will thank you Cindy um but I do want to acknowledge uh this so BSIP I'm sure most of you are familiar with Crystal Hickman she visited our garden and I identified uh, seven different native bees growing in our garden. So the ground nesting bees and cavity uh, nesting bees as well. Unfortunately, I am not as <laughs> talented <laughs> with identifying uh, bees as a crystal. So I can't always identify the bees, but yes, she's amazing. And she did come out and identify and she took some beautiful pictures uh, of bees that were in our garden. Yes, yeah. Cindy, bee, uh, bee sip is amazing. I have her cards. I have her card set. Yes, she is awesome. And then, right just before that, Rosalie was asking where you obtain your organic mulch. Oh, I will. Okay, so different places. Okay, so at uh, the box stores, you can get them in a bag. Okay, so I use the redwood uh, cedar mulch or also at the um, the large yards. So I'll just say, you know, your uh, nursery. But the box stores, you can get them in a bag. And if you want to communicate with me, 
um, offline, I'm, you know, more than happy to share. I just don't like to just publicly just, you know, give brands, you know, just to be fair, you know, to different, you know. Well, I understand, except the Theodore Payne Foundation deserves to be shouted from the rooftops, right? But yeah, so Theodore Payne Foundation, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, Theodore Payne. Yeah. Uh, all right. I think I think we're at the end of any of the questions. Is there are there any questions that I missed? All right, I'm not hearing anything. Oh wait. Uh, Al is oh Al has some a mysterious insect holes in the dirt in his yard, which I've seen. Um, uh -huh. Let's see, and, and beetles that yeah, he's suspecting a ground nesting bee, which seems reasonable. Yeah, you know, when Crystal was here, she uh, identified, you know, the holes that were in the yard. So oh, that must have been bee, exciting. Bee. Oh, it was so exciting. Yeah, she spoke I'm to the so chapter, much. I don't know, in the last year or two. And it was, it was a, nice, a very nice presentation. Oh, say that again? I said she spoke to the chapter um, a year or two oh, ago. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. Just, yeah. All right. Well, I think I think that's down to the end of our questions. So I want to thank you again. It was a wonderful presentation. And if if someone wants to get in touch with you, I see that your Instagram and your email are right on the the page right there. And um, that information is also linked, I believe, from the uh, the website where we've advertised uh, this meeting. And then later later we'll have a link to this YouTube video, also from that same website. So it'll be on the on the uh, blog post that advertises this meeting. I'll update it with a link to the YouTube video of this very same meeting. Sure. And yes. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And any specifics about a uh, brand, you know, you can reach out to me. Right. I don't mind sharing. I just don't, uh, yeah. don't like to share publicly like that. Of so. course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording now.